slides are available at tiny. This for this presentation, the slides are available at tiny.cc slash QAR, QRP Amateur Radio. And the reason why I say that is because there's a number of links in the presentation you might want to visit. So my website, kzt.com, uh, has a QRP page on it with a lot of resources for various clubs and QRP activities, which many of you are already familiar with. And of course, you speaking of the GQRP club, this is a little redundant. Uh, you all know what Q QRP is, so I can skip over that portion. A small minority of organizations use 10 watts for the QRP figure f on single sideband. That's been a, a point of contention on the discussion boards this last week. And of course, milliwatting, for those of you that aren't familiar, QRPP is using less than one watt of power. Now, I don't have a um, specific reason why I went into QRP, but 40 years ago when I first got my license, it was more accidental uh, than specific. I, uh, when I got my license, I had... Uh, seen various radios advertised in the past and one of the radios that struck my fancy was the uh, 10 tech pm series um, and i always thought that'd be neat but at the time i didn't have my license i was a teenager and 54 dollars on a paperboy salary was a fortune so i never did buy one back then uh, but by the time i did get my license in 1981 i thought well maybe i should look at something like that and uh and do that so um I actually ended up with a Tentec uh, Argonaut 515. So I started my career with uh, two watts. As a novice in the US, no, no one told me that novices aren't supposed to start with QRP. So I did it inadvertently. And there were a number of resources I quickly found that were very useful in my QRP career. Uh, the great book by, um, by uh, oh, I'm going to forget his call now. The Joy of QRP from uh, Adrian Weiss. I can't remember his call. I'm sorry, it was a zero call. I think it's W0 RSP, but I'm not positive. And once I realized what can be done with QRP, I was really hooked. And there was a number of reasons. It was also great because there was lower cost involved. Also, I lived in an apartment, so having less uh, interference to the other people around was great. And there was always challenges. But one of the things I can remember is learning about QRP through the Sprat magazine. Uh, once I decided I was interested in this, I found I found the GQRP club in Spratt, and I also found the QRP ARCI group in the United States. I joined both clubs. They both had quarterly journals, which at the time were sized perfectly to slide into my lab coat pocket. So I worked in a hospital laboratory, and every day at lunch and on my break, I'd have a QRP uh, quarterly or a Spratt in my pocket that I could pull out and read. So. The GQRP, GQRP club was very influential in my, uh, my uh, QRP journey. So once I decided I was really interested in QRP, there's challenges, of course. Um, but I decided to approach those challenges by pursuing some things such as awards, contesting, and just a whole idea of the personal things I wanted to do on QRP. Just like any other area of amateur radio, there's so many different flavors of QRP. There's people that are minimalist. They want to build something with one transistor and uh, three other parts on a board and make it one, like the one which is, fits in a very tiny case. There's builders out there, and builders extend from very simple equipment to extremely complex equipment. There's, there's many builders out there who are very state-of-the-art. So when you look at Farhan's work and you look at the QCX and some other radios out there, they're really state-of-the-art QRP radios. There's people that are experimenters and designers. There's people that love to be portable ops, just as G0POT did that excellent presentation a little earlier. And then there's a group called Optimized Station Operators, and that's probably where the category I fall into most. I'm going to operate on low power, but my idea is to operate. That's my favorite thing to do. So I have a beam. I have multiple antennas. I have a Elecraft K3. It's a 10-watt version, but it's a K3. So that's the thing I like to do. And as I mentioned earlier, builders, designers, and some of the real uh, 
the real uh, important developments in amateur radio over the last couple of years have came from the QRP builders area. The whole idea of Elecraft started with the very simple K, uh, the very simple QRP radios. The uh, first flex radio, the 1500, was a QRP radio. Uh, we've already talked about a lot of these factors about the less weight, uh, simple antennas. And of course, we don't want to forget about pedestrian mobile. If you're going to be moving around, you need a small radio. You don't want a lot of RF ra radiating yourself. And uh, being able to operate with very small batteries is very helpful. So uh, by its very nature, pedestrian mobile operation is often or most often QRP. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the style that I like to operate at QRP is to get the best equipment I can, get the best antenna I can, and operate within the QRP parameters of 5 watts or less on both phone and CW. Now there's some myths out there about QRP, and if you ask a bunch of Q people, they'll say, well, you have to use a QRP radio. No, most radios can be adjusted uh, for power out. And some people say you only can use CW. Well, that's not the case. I have plenty of single sideband contacts. And another myth is you can't win contests. Well, if you don't realize that there's a lot of uh, contests that have QRP categories, and if you keep entering them, things will happen, like trophies will start showing up. You notice behind me, let me move over, there's a couple trophies on the wall from the, uh, w, the, from the CQ Worldwide. And here's a trophy from the Maryland QSO party last year in the QRP category. So there's nothing about that you can't get trophies and win contests with QRP. You can't work DX. Well, my DX CC total right now is 326. Worked uh, mixed, uh, 314 CW and 301 phone. And I do use a beam, not a very fancy beam, but I do have a beam. And you must use QRP all the time. Well, Nick Nick mentioned this morning he has his 400 watts ready to go at a moment's notice. I don't have 400 watts here. I do have a radio that I could run 100 watts on, but I don't typically do that. There's a couple ways to adjust your radio. If you have a QRO radio and you want to operate a QRP, you can use something like a step attenuator, or many radios allow you to adjust the uh, power out very easily. The whole idea of operating CW only, well, CW is a very proficient mode in QRP, so that's sort of where this, this idea comes from, and a lot of QRPers are very ardent CW operators, but I like to operate all bands and modes. I feel that my chances of working QRP contacts go up the more bands and the more modes I can use. And I have was an early adopter of FT8 and FT4. I actually started with JT65, and I'm now at a DXCC uh, QRP 5 watts with FT8, FT4 of around 215. I've worked all states on 10 bands with uh, FT8, and I need two more contacts to complete my 11th band. I need two 6-meter contacts, Alaska and Hawaii, and I'll have 160 through 6 meters, all 11 bands with uh, QRP. One of the things about working uh, DX with QRP is patience. That's the biggest thing. It's not the power you need, it's the patience. You're not going to be the first one through the pile up every time. But if you pick, if you have good operating technique and you know how to jump in at just the right time and call it the right time, uh, you can get into any, almost any D expedition. I've only had one that I had no success at all with, and that was Scarborough Reef. And it's rather hard uh hard on any mode or I'm sorry with any amount of power here from Ohio uh, to work Scarborough there's some countries I haven't worked but I haven't heard of them yet and uh, don't confuse low power with poor signals you can have the you want to put the best low power signal you can so quality antennas quality feed line are all important to making sure that that five watts gets from your radio and gets propagated out via your antenna. There's no reason to uh, cut that five watts down to a half a watt with bad feed line or poor antennas. Um, a lot of QRP operators operate QRO also. Some of them are contesters. Uh, my QR op QRO operations are pretty much special event station and when I work with my local club on field day. Although I've changed that and I've been operating field day on my own, so I've been operating uh, QRP. 
These are a little bit older numbers here. They're from a little while back, but you can notice that I operate on all bands available to me uh, with the exception I don't have the newer, the two new low bands in the United States, the 220 and the 60, uh, 603 kilohertz or whatever it is. I can't remember the 630 kilohertz. I haven't experimented with those yet, but I do operate uh, 160 through 6 meters, 2 meters and 440 here. Um, as I said, these numbers are a little bit old, but they're pretty accurate. Uh, this is my worked all states. 11 bands. I've worked all states on all 11 bands with, when I use all modes, but as I said earlier, I'm just trying to do a single mode FT8 to finish it up also. Uh, these are just some of the countries I've worked. I'm pretty much down to needing the the, uh, the rare islands. My only thing I need in Europe yet is uh, Mount Athos, and uh, I'm still hoping to get that. Uh, just to give you an idea of what countries I work as far as the prevalence, uh, you'll notice that the number, the, the top station, of course, is U.S. because I'm in the U.S. and Canada's first in most of the cases. But as you notice, when, that, when you look at different modes, you see different mixes. So the Italians tend to be a little bit higher in the phone contest than in some of the other ones. But you'll notice that my uh, stations that I work vary. And also part of this is dependent on the fact that I work in a lot of contests so I can keep my DX, uh, my DX entities numbers up. And some of these countries tend to contest more than others. Um, my operating plan, uh, bands have changed over the years. Uh, originally I was a technician license only, so I was limited in the bands I could operate phone on and I did not have access to 20 meters. Once I got my extra class license uh, a number of years ago, it really changed my operating. Uh, so I was operating on all the bands and, and modes. And you'll notice that from 1981 to 2015, I was about 60% CW uh, over that whole time. Uh, but when you look at more recent years, my numbers have skewed quite a bit because I've been working a lot of FT8 and FT4. Uh, another myth is that QRP is only possible on the upper bands. A lot of people discount uh, the low bands, 160, 80 meters, uh, especially in the United States. Not as much as it is in, in the UK or in Europe, but a lot of people here think that 160 is impossible to get on, and that's not the case at all. Uh, 40 meters is one of the favorites for QRPers, but I try to get on all the different bands. This is my first radio and I still have it. And it's, I built this case very soon after I got it and added some things in there afterward. But this is my, Elk, my uh, 10 Tech Argonaut 515. There were only about 800 of these built. So they're pretty rare and I'm I've not planning on getting rid of this. And I pulled out every once in a while. This was a great improvement. Uh, about a year after I got it, I purchased a uh, selective filter for it. And it's a filter that inserts into the IF, so it's not just an audio filter. And this made a big difference on CW. I, I was living in an apartment at the time, so my shack had to be completely portable. So it's in this wooden case. I could pick it up. The back of it's open so I can attach antennas to, to it. But this was my first, uh, I'll call it go box, to move around the, the apartment. This is an example of a little box I built after I got my first 817. Uh, that was one of my favorite QRP radios at the time. I still have that, and I use it for satellite operation. This is the first go box I built for going out in the field, and this has my Elecraft K, uh, K2 in it, and I'm operating in Maine on uh, a Cadillac Mountain in Acadia National Park for field day. And I was the first station in the United States to have the sun fall on me on field day because I wasn't the furthest east, but I... The combination of being quite far east and being up on the top of the mountain meant the sun hit me quite early. Over the years, I've uh, acquired some other radios. This is my KX3, uh, and this is my go box. I call this a rapid deployment go box. because I simply open the top, pull the front off, and I'm ready to operate. There's a battery in the radio itself, but there's also a, a lithium ferrite battery in the top. So there's a number of radios out there. Uh, when you look back through time, these are some of the radios that have been out there. There's, of course, some newer radios. The 705 is, of course, replaced the ICOM 703. Um, 
but I still love playing with my Argonaut. And over the years, some of these rigs have been very important in the development, not only of QRP, but in the whole development of amateur radio uh, production. Back in the 90s, uh, in the early 2000s, there was an explosion of QRP kits, and some of these ended up turning into production type of radios. So the North Cal kits are really the genesis of the Elecraft brand. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a rehash of the monoband kits that many of them have been cloned and uh, are being produced in China, and you can pick them on eBay, pick them up on eBay very cheaply. But be please be aware that many times the parts are not correct, and sometimes the performance is not that great. But you can uh, still rework them and use them. Recently, there's been a lot of what I'll call KX3 knockoffs. Uh, the Zygu Zygu uh, 5105 is a very uh, very capable commercial radio, but when you look on eBay, you'll see a whole variety of radios that look very similar to this size and style that are basically clones. A lot of them are clones of the Ubix. Some of them are clones of the QCX. This was uh, the radio that I really lusted after as a teenager. Again, as I said, $54 was unattainable, unattainable amount of money for a paper boy in my time, but I eventually purchased a couple of these and I have a number of them. Uh, they are a direct conversion receiver, and if you smack your hand on the table, the microphonics are such that if you have a headphone on, it'll pretty much blow your ears out. So you have to be careful. If you have a key that you're pounding too, if you're pounding brass a little too hard, you'll hear it in the radio. Um, this is part of a collection from WHKC. Uh, he had a whole lot of techno tech head tech equipment on the web. Um, but I've been very much involved with this. My my children, when they were very young at uh, Hamfest, would be able to tell Technic 10 tech equipment from uh, many feet away when they would come and get me. And many 509s, 505s, and 515s came home to pass through my house. I've actually lost track of how many I've owned over the years. This is a 505. By the way, the 505 never says 505 on the front of it. Um, the 505 developed into the 509. And the main difference is where they expanded the 10 meter band, they made the receiver much better. By the way, many of you, many of you might not realize that when Tente came out with Argonaut, they actually ran an article in CQ in uh, November of 1971, talking about the radio and also inviting you to make your own. They talked about how they designed it and invited you to think about building your own. Uh, this is the 5515. Uh, the price back in 81 when I bought it was right around $420, and I end up uh, seeing many of these sell for more than that price used. I have a whole uh, description of a presentation I did for another club called the Odyssey of the Argonauts, and you could read through that. I also have the second coming of the Odyssey of the Argonauts when I used my 509 on FT4 uh, the last couple of years. Here's a very important uh, radio in the whole QRP generation. Uh, early generations. This is the Heathkit uh, HW8. Uh, it was preceded by the HW7, which had much poorer performance than the HW8. And then the final version of this was the HW9. The HW8 was a CW only radio, direct conversion. Here's a picture of the North Cow uh, 40. And then we went through the whole Altoids tin popularity, putting small rigs like the Rock Might 40 inside this Altoids tin. Single single bands uh, radios designed by uh, Dave Benson, K1SWL. The Oak Hills Research Series. I have a, one of these power um, power meters in my shack, SWR power meters. They're great, and I have actually two of them, one in each end of the room here. As I mentioned earlier. Um, Wayne and Eric of Elcraft, they grew out of their involvement with the North Cow Group. And we're here with this quote, Wayne talks about the first design of the K2, which uh, was basically, a lot of it was based on the work he did with the North Cow 40, the Sierra and the SST. And here is a uh, Elcraft K2. 
Uh, it was a very modular radio. You could buy the basic CW only radio, and then you could add modules to it. You could add a single sideband module. Eventually, the last module I think they, that was designed was the DSP module. Uh, and my wife uh, cornered Wayne and Eric one year at Dayton and said they were just like uh, drug dealers. Every year they introduced a new drug, a new module for everyone to buy at Dayton that year after they got them addicted. Smaller version, the K1, uh, had multi boards stacked in it. It was a four band model or a three band model, depending on which one you had. And then the, uh, the K3 came out. The K3 is now 20 years old. Uh, it, we don't re realize the KX1. Then the KX3, I had KX3 number 43 uh, that I got at Dayton the first year it was introduced. KX2, which came out a few years later. The whole Ubix series, and Fairhound talked about this and uh, s some of the things on this, but uh, we've already went over that, but it's been a real uh, watershed in the QRP field. The QCX uh, from Hans has been a remarkable radio in the development and many things have grown out from it. And when I have people asking about, you know, first radio, if I tell them if you're interested in CW, you can't go wrong with a QCX as a first starter radio. Even though it's only a single band, it has great performance, easy to use. Uh, here's the newer version, the QCRX uh, Plus. As I mentioned earlier, these, these all these clones available very inexpensively that can be re reworked into a halfway decent radio. Uh, many of them don't work very well the way they arrive. List of some of the clubs, mostly U.S. clubs, but of course the GQRP club is always very prominent in the QRP ARCI group. Here's a Sprat version of 2018 and the QRP quarterly. Actually, I was disappointed when the quarterly got larger because it wouldn't fit in my pockets anymore. And as I mentioned earlier, this presentation is available at tiny.ccqar. And uh, I'd be happy to answer some questions, uh, go over other material. I know that that was a little rushed, and uh, here's my contact information. And I don't have it on this slide, but I will bring up another slide presentation that has the slide I want. So this, let me just bring this up real quick here. This slide will get you to all of my presentations that I've done over the last year, for the most part. I've been working on worked all, uh, present all states awards. So tiny.cc slash k8zt dash p. And I'll put that in the chat also. Um, get that in the chat. I'm sorry, if someone else wants to put that in the chat with HTTP in front of it so that people can get to it, I can't get to the chat right now for some reason. But this has all my presentations. So if you're interested in contesting, I've done a number of introductions to contesting. Uh, Fun with Morris was actually an outgrowth of uh, a, a short presentation I did to a bunch of people in a technician class in the US. No, there's no code required, but one of the things that's suggested is while you're teaching, you introduce people to what code is. So I put together this whole presentation called Fun with Morris, which I think some of you may find useful. A number of presentations on FT8 and FT4. Uh, Broadcast radio history. This was the 100th anniversary of the first commercial broadcast in the U.S. last year, uh, last November, actually. And KDKA is very close to me, and I would listen to it as a, as a kid growing up. Uh, also, information on logging software, contest logging software. Whole section on SDRs, and I've really been pressing, the, I've really been using this with my work with uh, students. I'm the youth coordinator for Ohio. And I have this little four page quick start guide on using SDRs to listen to shortwave radio. It's sort of like being able to give a kid a, uh, a very simple shortwave receiver, but not have to worry about having them have an antenna or having to worry about it. And uh, this information covers both the web SDRs and the Kiwis and talks about how to use it. I sort of designed this so anyone could pick it up and work through it on their own, including what frequencies they should try, what mode they should set it for, and some notes about that. 
So this is available. This is uh, at tiny.cc slash free RX for free receiver. Also information on the QR, the state QSO, state QSO party challenge. It's something going on in the U.S. where we have 45 contests throughout the year of all the state QSO parties. And then we give a composite score so that people can uh, aggregate all their scores for all of them to get awards. Even though you don't have a technician license, this is basically our basic license in the United States. And I put together a whole presentation on life beyond the local repeater for uh, people starting out a whole bunch of ideas that they can do to operate different modes, different activities, as opposed to just staying on two meter FM or 440 repeaters. And of course, I have an article on, I have a presentation on trains that includes my wife and my uh, K8 ODP and my travel through the UK back in 1991 when we went to Glasgow. Um, and then we traveled around the UK. It also includes train trips around the United States. And information on youth. I know this is specifically written for the US, but a lot of information on youth and amateur radio. If you're involved in recruitment or training or anything involved with youth, I suggest you take a look at these presentations. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share here. And I will attempt to answer some questions. Hopefully, we have some questions in the Q and A. We and have some, some questions. Yes. Can you, can you see those or? or yeah. Let's uh, see. Jack? What is the what is the good operating procedure that would make one more successful QRP or QRO? Well, I don't think that's the the answer. It's not whether it's QRP or it's QRO. It really comes down to um, your the amount of operating that you do and the quality of operating you do no matter what amount of power you're using. Uh, you mentioned the Complete the Exer book by Bob Loker. That's a great book. Uh, it's a little dated in some respects because things have changed as far as the Exer goes, but that's probably one of the five most important things I read as, a, as an amateur radio operator. Uh, that was very good. The AWRL operating manual, the RSBGB operating manual, not the, not the handbooks, but the operating manuals uh, because as I said, I really like to operate, so I wanted to develop my operating ability. So the main thing is to really get your operating ability down. And I feel that when I'm on QRO, it's sort of like, sort of like shooting fish in a barrel because I use my QRP techniques that I've learned on QRO, and they're really killer. So I've had to develop techniques to be able to make contacts with low power. And I sort of feel that's unfair that when I use them on QRO, that's sort of like you know uh, going hunting with a bazooka. So the question is, do you want to reveal those detailed techniques and, and then have everybody use them against you? No, no. I, actually, I have a slide in one of my what, in, I did a presentation to the four days in May group on contesting. And I talked about all the things. And then I said the final secret to winning is and I had the page totally uh uh, it was fuzzy, so you couldn't read it in the audience. And I kept trying to adjust the. I said, we need to adjust the projector. And of course, there was no way to adjust the fuzzy slide in. Let me just mention one thing about contesting real quick. I know that a lot of QRPers don't, you know, sort of poo-poo contesting. Well, the way I look at it is contesting is a great opportunity for everyone. So if you're, uh, if you, you don't like contesting at all, take that weekend and spend it on the, on the uh, work bands, you know, explore something new, try something out. When everyone's busy contesting, you can sneak away and use the parts of the band they're not using. But if you, if you tolerate contesting, but you're not interested in the competition, use it as an opportunity to sweep up extra contacts, get new countries, get new states, get new contacts on new bands, uh, you know, take advantage of it. And as I said earlier, as long as you can give them the exchange that they're waiting for, you can ignore their exchange because your goal is just to work new countries. So uh, you can milk contests for your advantage, even if you're not that interested in them. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure on the question. Sorry, is or are. That's just correcting is uh, oh, error. In that's okay. I do that all the time. I get my, my wife's always in the background correcting me, so no problem. So data modes and QRP on battery are probably the most approachable and attract the things the new hams these days, especially young people. A clear line from their smartphones and Wi-Fi, etc. Uh, when I do demonstrations for young youngsters with amateur radio, I do find that probably the, the least interesting thing to many of them is a voice contact. Um, they don't see the magic in that. 
They do, though, like digital modes because they can see something visually on the screen when I'm doing it, and they appreciate that aspect. It's also sort of like a gaming thing. If you ever use WSJTX, you're double-clicking on things to make things happen. So they do like that. But I've also found that they like CW. And what I do is um, I use the CW decoder, even though it's not perfect, so I can display something on the projector for the kids to see. Also, before I ever turn the radio on with CW, I send my call sign to them a number of times. I said, you don't need to be able to recognize anything else except for these three things. I send the CQ so they know what it sounds like. I send my call sign number of times so they sound like, and I send the word, I send Roger, the R to them. I said, these are the things you need to know. We're going to listen for someone that's calling this CQ. And you'll be able to hear it and understand it. Once we hear that, I'm going to send my call sign. And then I want you all to listen to see if you hear my call sign come back from them. You don't need to worry about what their call is or anything. I'll put that up on the screen because we're going to decode that. But I need you all to listen for my call sign. And they get excited by doing that. I also have um, a project where we build uh, keys out of clothespins. And I think that's what they're called in the UK. I'm not sure, but the things you hang up clothes with on a clothesline, we call them uh, wooden clothespins here. And on my website, there's a, a clothespin key made with a uh, little computer buzzer and an 8-volt battery. And I have the kids build those, and then they send uh, – yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. That was convenient. You had that right there. I normally would have the key here, but I don't have it handy in front of me. Um, so I find that they like CW. So I would say that the CW and digital modes often have a lot more appeal. Now, once I find a kid who's really interested, they like listening to anything. And those, uh, I, I think that the time that they enjoy the phone contacts the most is when I give them the, the online software-defined radio so, uh, information to use on their own laptop or their own tablet or their own phone, and then they start tuning. One of the things that's interesting is most kids have never tuned a radio. They are not used to tuning something in. Even a TV, they don't tune it. They choose a channel. So the whole idea of having stations to tune in was very interesting. And I showed them how I, I, I was running the, uh, the spotting, uh, DX spotting log, the reverse break network and other things like that. So they could see where stations were at and then go find them. So that was very interesting. Uh, would it be useful to consider a central repository for some of these kit designs? You know, that, that's a very interesting thing. The whole idea of, of historically documenting things uh, is sometimes spotty in amateur radio. We can sometimes go back through the journals and the magazines and find information, but sometimes if you don't know where to look, it's hard to find these things out. So I think we are, in some cases, maybe uh, not paying as much attention to these things as we should. And sometimes it's not just a matter of recording, but uh, the, the talk yesterday that Pete gave on valve, transmi valve uh, uh, transmitters, that was an invaluable talk because he talked about going back and looking at old designs with a critical eye for safety and for, uh, for proper use of things. So that was very important. I think we can learn a lot from those things. Uh, from Jack. Uh, this assumes that the op has tried to optimize within reason for those losses in units and coax. Yeah, you know, again, uh, there's a lot of ways you can do this. I lived in an apartment and I used to operate on uh, satellites, so 450 and uh, 2 meters. So my solution was I couldn't afford really fancy coax. I just made a really short run. I was using a 15-foot run of coax. So even though I wasn't using the best coax, the... The, the amount of line that I had meant the loss was low to begin with. So there's a lot of things you can do to improve without spending a lot of money uh, as far as coax losses and tuners, et cetera. Uh, let's see, how long did it take me to build my K2? Uh, my K2 took me quite a while because I was very patiently working through and it never really ended because as I said earlier, I kept buying new modules all the time. So I was always buying new modules and putting them in there. I remember one year begging Wayne and Eric when we were in Dayton, I said, you really need to have a rig interface module. And they said, no, nah, that's not necessary. Most of the people that use this aren't interested in the interfacing type of thing. I said, I want to contest with it, and I can't contest with it like I can with my 817 because I always forget to change the band in my log. I need the radio to tell my, my logging software what band I'm on and what frequency. So, uh, yes, I was always doing uh, work on that. Um, but I... Really, I think probably the thing I enjoyed was the smaller kits even more. I enjoyed building the K1 much better than the K2 because 
I had a one week I was on vacation for my job and I said, I'm going to build the K1 this week. I'm going to do it out on the deck and I'm going to have a great time. Well, it rained all week. So what I did is I sat in front of an open window so I could still fill the fresh air and built my K, my, my K1 uh, that way. So it was very enjoyable to build and I was able to build it in one week. So sometimes I like the small kits better. I, I as I said, I'm an operator, not a builder, not a, not a, uh, so my my fame, my area is really on uh, the uh, the operating aspect of QRP. Other questions. Uh, one thing that always comes up when I talk about all these numbers is how do you know how many places you've worked? Well, I keep uh, spreadsheet. I I dump my log into spreadsheets and I do analyze. I analyze them all the time to keep track of how what countries I've worked on, what bands, on what modes as a way so that I know what, what else I want to work, but it also gives me statistics like which, which uh, station have I talked to the most, which things of that nature. So I love, I love statistics. So I love playing with spreadsheets and analyzing to see where I've worked. After every big contest, I like to analyze my log and look through it to see what I can do better next time. You know, what, what multipliers did I miss? What uh, continents did I miss? And when do I need to, what's the best time to try and do that? And as, as some John said, Logger32 does all that. Well, it does, but you wouldn't believe what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm obsessive. I want to know how many times, you know, what country I've worked the most and which operator I've worked the most and which operator I've worked the most on which bands. And there are a number of great logging softwares. And as I said earlier, I have a whole program on logging software. Really, if you're not doing electronic logging, you're missing a lot of great opportunities. I know that it takes a little bit of learning curve. Uh, and it may not always be that convenient, but it's really nice to have a comprehensive log with all your contacts in it so you can look back at it. As I said, this is my 40th year and I enjoy going back and looking through my old logs and doing things like, you know, every time I talk to someone or do a presentation, a lot of times if a name comes up during that presentation, I'll go back and check my log uh, to see whether I've worked them before. And they're always soft and surprised when I can tell them all the days I've worked them before. What's your Other advice? questions? with a big pile of uh, paper that needs to go into an electronic log. <laughs> yeah, once you get it in, keep putting them in immediately so that you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> um, so one thing we could do is, is if people want to raise their hand, if, if uh, you don't want to type your question, if you, uh, if you click the raise hand button, we can, uh, we can uh, watch for you and, and uh, let you ask it live. And while they're doing that, I'm going to just show this picture. This is the this is the first slide in my uh, youth and amateur radio. This is my my grandson Holden, and he was eight or nine at the time, and he's using the closed pin keyer here. And somewhere in the same presentation, he's using the. Uh, let me get to that real quick here. So, what do you use for contacts on the closed pin keyer? You uh, got the spring. You got the brass laser. brass thumbtacks. You can use regular thumbtacks if you're willing to sand the, the finish off, but I find brass ones work the best. And you can find the decorative brass ones on eBay and Eham and other places like this. So this is my, my grandson Holden using uh, an online software defined radio with his cell phone. And uh, from Victor, he said, operating re well requires skill and experience over first over first years. Once learned, you can slip past the big guns, all shouting on chance and he's he, on channel. And he's correct on that. We got we got some new questions here. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm a new ham, and I hear that you have lots of experience with teaching kids and introducing new people to the hobby. Do you have any advice on learning CW? Yes, the first advice I have is don't learn it the way I did. Don't look at anything. Don't try and write things down. You know, get used to listening to it and getting the characters fast enough so that you can't count. That's, I think, the most important thing that you can start someone off with. The other thing, too, is it's, I think it's so much nicer to be able to teach it with the idea that it's a great tool to use as opposed to a requirement for licensing. When it was a licensing requirement, it was it was painful for a lot of people. And I think it turned a lot of people off to the idea of operating CW. Uh, what is the lowest power, uh, the contact that I've made, QRPPP? I've made a, uh, a 100 milliwatt contact, a number of them. Uh, I, 
as I most of the time I run five watts here, but occasionally I run one watt. Um, the best contacts I made have, have not necessarily been the lowest power, but they've been the surprises, like the 160 contact uh, with E51 and uh, North Cook. Um, that's you know that's that was fun. Um, getting over the pole for the first time, getting over the 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 ocean for the first time on 80 meters. Uh, I remember so much when I was able to finally start making consistent 80 meter contacts when I changed my antenna to a sloper here and um, did that. My favorite QRP rig of all time is definitely the 515. Bruce loves the, the K1. I like my K1 also, but I'm just going to have to say that I will always have a, a very fond spot in my spot in my heart for the, the uh, Argonaut 515. Let's see, some really practical videos on, on building uh, code speed. Uh, on YouTube, there's just some great ones. There's also a very good one if you want to move up to the next level of copying. K1IG did a presentation for the QSO Today Expo on copying your head, in, copying in your head in March. Not the most recent one, but the time before that was very good. Uh, cloud log. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, and also, I just want to mention, I am absolutely happy to do presentations for anyone's club. Uh, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm trying to work all states and all countries on, uh, pr present all states and present all countries. Uh, this is just a screenshot here showing how I use my 5, 590 sometimes. There's software that, come, that, you can, that you can get for it for free from Kenwood that I can display on a screen for the students to be able to see. Again, it's not perfect, but it, it, it gets lots of the parts down for them. Here's another shot, a couple more shots of the clothespin keyers. Oh, and don't forget about satellite operations. I operate with my 817 on the low Earth orbit satellites, and it does a great job. And I find that that's another great activity to share with kids. Uh, to be able to, you know, because it has a lot of science components. We're not only using the radio and everything, but we're also figuring out the tracking of the satellite, the time factors involved. There's a whole lot of lessons you can do with uh, the low Earth orbit satellites. Oh, and also whenever possible, try and do things outside with kids. That's another big plus. And they loved fox hunting. My students that I work with all the time love fox hunting. And fox hunting, of course, doesn't even require you to have a license to be a hunter. I want to get to the end here real quick. Oh, by the way, I have copies of the PDF files of all the Zach and Max comic books on my website. I just want to get to the end of this slideshow. My slideshow, this is a really long slideshow, as you can see. So again, this is the link to all my presentations, tiny.cc slash k8zt-p. And I would be happy to do the, uh, presentations for your local club. What type of key do you recommend uh, for learning CW? I would I would recommend paddles. Now I've I've I, you know I started off the key way back then, but I spent some time with the CW Ops group recently just so I could learn how to use a paddle better better. And I think it really is a more multi sense type of learning that you get from the tactical feel of the paddles as opposed to using a straight key. Are you? Uh... You're not one of those iambic guys, are you? Uh, yes, I am, but I'm not great at it. My favorite, my favorite way to send either. CW is right here. <laughs> I can't. I don't think I'd get it up there. The, my keyboard is my favorite way to send CW. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, and yeah. I actually have a little, little, um, little microprocessor built uh, keyer that fits in just a little tiny case, and I even got a really small keyboard. It's only five inches wide, so I can carry it in my my go kit. I haven't used a, uh, a, 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 I got a 10 tech single paddle that I used to use years ago and I haven't touched it in, in a while, but the timing, I feel like my straight keying is better because of my time spent with machine spacing. So I know what it's supposed to sound like coming from my own hand. Somehow that. Uh, yeah. And someone says I'm cheating with the, the, the keyboard. Well, that's for the benefit of all the people on the other side of my QSOs. It's not cheating when they can copy me. <laughs> and uh, someone from Sterling said they're always looking for club members to do talk. We'd be happy to do that. My wife and I visited Sterling actually a few years back. 
we stormed the castle uh, after we got off the train. So uh, she, just, my wife just toned in. My wife, by the way, is K8ODP, Linda. And uh, even though she's not as active as she used to be on radio, she uh, understands everything and has been very supportive through the years. Other questions, comments, complaints? We're, we're about at the uh, time. Oh, very good. So did I manage to fill the time for you, Nick? Steve? Yeah, you were absolutely brilliant. Uh, absolutely brilliant, Anthony. Well done. And thanks for stepping into the breach there where we lost our uh, our contributors this evening. And uh, and, and Anthony, as you know, because you've spoken at uh, Denby Dow Radio Club a couple of times, um, you know, Anthony has been a superstar for us. Um, one of his best ones, even though lots of people hate FT8, uh, was him doing his FT8 talk and running some live contacts on air and... Uh, it did get people talking. It was it was great. So well done, Anthony, this afternoon. Really good. Yeah, thanks for, for me too, Anthony. And uh, bizarrely, I've literally just got an email in from Carl, um, who should have been presenting, uh, uh, asking if they were actually still um, scheduled to to be on. So there's obviously been some confusion over times or uh, or modes of operating. I'm not quite sure what's gone wrong there, but uh, you did a fantastic job there, Anthony, and, uh, and d double brownie points for uh, for stepping in. And it's close pegs in the UK, not pins, but pegs. But uh, ah, okay. But we, we know what you meant. We, we know what you meant. Well, the the old the old style without the spring looked more like a peg. It was, I guess the name stayed when the, when the mechanism changed. That's you know, right. and I guess, I guess if you, you know, the person that said I was cheating with a keyboard, if you really want to send Morse code, you got to send it with that clothespin so that it's stressed. You know, it, the, the, the pressure on it is unbelievable to put, to make those characters. So you really get to feel it. And if you put the thumbtack up the other way, you get the double p torture of pushing your hand on a thumbtack every time too. Well, I think that's uh, probably time to, uh, to call it a day. Uh, we're, we're, uh, I've had a, an